Chapter 4, The Presidency. The presidency has become the most powerful office in the U.S. government. Now, this is not exactly the way the Founding Fathers wanted it to be back in 1787 when they created the Constitution. They envisioned Congress to be the center of the government, even though they wanted all three branches to have relatively equal power and they didn't want uh, any one uh, branch to become too powerful. They always thought that Congress would be the center of the government, and by that I mean they, they wanted Congress to really lead the government and take the initiative in passing laws and deciding whether the country would go to war and uh, make other big decisions. Uh, that's not how it's uh, transpired over the course of American history because as the size of the nation and the government grew uh, from 1787 to now, so has the power of the presidency. The presidency has become much more powerful uh, today than it was uh, back in the day of George Washington's first presidency. Why is the president so powerful? Well, there are three reasons. Uh, first of all, we only have one president. Uh, unlike members of Congress who have to work together and cooperate and negotiate and compromise and share power and share the spotlight, we only have one president. Uh, the president makes all the decisions by himself. He has all the power to himself. And he has all the spotlight, the media spotlight, to himself. And so that's one reason why the president's so powerful. Another reason the president is so powerful is that the president doesn't just have formal powers, meaning the powers that are granted to him uh, because he's president, the president also has informal powers, powers that come uh, not uh, because he's president, but because he's such an important person, uh, sort of related to the presidency, but nowhere in the Constitution do these, for, do, do these informal powers uh or these informal powers uh, stated. And we'll talk more about uh, the formal powers and the informal powers that the president has in, in a few minutes. Uh, another reason why the president is so powerful is the president also has uh, more media access and, and exposure than any other politician in the United States, m much more than any governor, much more than any senator, much more than any member of the House of Representatives. Uh, for example, today, when President Trump says something or tweets something, it's all over the news. The news uh, will st even stop to report on something that the president has said. So, and this is not just Donald Trump, but every president before him uh, had the same access to the media and exposure in the media uh, that than than Donald Trump has, and much more than any other politician. So, president. So, the fact that we only have one president at a time, the fact that presidents have both formal powers and informal powers, and the fact that presidents have more media access access and exposure than any other politician, is what makes the president and the presidency so powerful. Many political experts fear that the presidency has become too powerful. This is what your textbook calls the power problem. And, 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 and if you've been reading the textbook, you'll see that in, in every chapter, your textbook authors talk about the power problem uh, within the particular topic that they're discuss discussing. And so the, 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 the basic idea, the power problem is how do we make sure that the government keeps functioning the way that the founding fathers envisioned it? And in the case of the presidency, this is clearly not what's happening. The presidency, the president is much more powerful than... Uh, than uh, they envisioned.
when they wanted uh, him to become. Uh, so many political experts today refer to the modern presidency as the imperial presidency, meaning that the presidents today and in, in, in the past few decades actually have acted less like leaders of a democratic system of government and more like emperors or, or uh, kings. And so today we talk about the imperial presidency as a presidency that's, in a sense, gotten out of hand that is much more powerful than the founding fathers envisioned. The presidency is the only nationally elected office in the United States. So, so the president is the only politician, the only elected office that is elected by the entire country at the same time. Uh, senators, as we saw in the last lecture, uh, only represent their state, and so they only have to run in their state. Members of the House of Representatives only represent their congressional district, and so only have to uh, run in their congressional district. The president, however, is elected by the whole country, and every voter in the country gets to vote for president every four years. Now, to be eligible to serve as president in the United States, one must satisfy three requirements. You have to be a natural-born citizen. Now, most people think that means you have to have been born in the United States in, in one of the 50 states or in Washington, D.C. That's not exactly the case. Uh, to be uh, considered a natural-born citizen, you either have to be born in the United States or you have to be born overseas on U.S. territory. So, for example, in 2008, John McCain ran for president against Barack Obama. John McCain was not born inside the United States. John McCain was born in the Panama Canal Zone in Panama when the territory around the Panama Canal was owned and operated by the United States. Uh, he was born there because his father was a Navy admiral, a very famous Navy admiral. And so his parents were stationed there when uh, John McCain was born. But even though John McCain was born overseas, he was still considered a natural born citizen under the Constitution. And so therefore he was eligible to run for president in 2008. Uh, in addition to being a natural-born citizen, you have to be at least 35 years old, and that's the oldest uh, thats the oldest age requirement for any office in the United States. Uh, for example, uh, to be eligible to, uh, to be uh, a senator, you have to be uh, 30 years old. To be uh, elected... Uh, uh, to serve as a member of the House of Representatives, you only have to be 25 years old. And in many cities around the country, many cities and towns around the country, you only have to be 18 to serve as a mayor. So uh, age qualifications for different offices around the country vary, the, uh, but the oldest age requirement for any office, uh, and this is set under the uh, in the Constitution uh, for to be president, you have to be at least 35 years old, and you have to have been uh, a resident in the United States for at least 14 years. So you have to have lived at least 14 years of your life in the United States before you can run for president, before you can serve as president. Uh, and by the way, to get back to the natural born citizen part, uh, the president is the only office in uh, the United States where one has to be a natural born citizen. Uh, you, cannot you cannot be born uh, in another country and immigrate to the United States, become a United States citizen, and then run for president. Uh, you can do that for if you want to be a senator or a member of the House of Representatives, but you cannot do that to be a president. And the reason for this is that the Family Fathers did not want any kind of foreign interference in the United States government. They didn't want 
uh, sort of spy for another country to come here and run for president. They wanted to make sure that pre- all presidents are true Americans, true natural-born citizens of the United States. Now, even though the voters of the United States uh, vote for president every four years, the president is not actually elected by the voters, uh, at least directly. The president is elected by something called the Electoral College. So the presidency is what we call an indirectly elected position uh, because the people still have a big say. We vote for the people in the Electoral College who then vote for the president. Uh, So we the people vote in November and then one month later in December the, the Electoral College votes. Now who is this Electoral College? Uh, the Electoral College is, is comprised, is made up of 538 people called electors, each of whom represent their state and Washington, D.C., which is a territory, not a state. Why 538 members? Well, that number is very closely related to the number of people in the U.S. Congress. Uh, remember uh, from uh, last lecture, I said that there are 535 members of Congress. So 535 members of Congress, 538 members of the Electoral College. Uh, there are three more members of the Electoral College than there are members of Congress. And that's because not only are states represented in the Electoral College. Not only do states, the people living in states, get to decide who the president is going to be, but also the people who live in Washington, D.C. So uh, they get three members of the Electoral College to represent Washington, D.C. Now, every state has a different number of people who represent them in the Electoral College. And number of people, the number of electors that each state gets is uh, tied to the number of people who live in the state. The more people that live in a state, the more electors that it gets. So it's tied to population. The bigger the state, the more electors. The smaller the state, the fewer electors. So every state has at least three Uh, electors because every state has at least three members of Congress. Every state has two uh, senators, just like every other state, and every state has at least one member of the House of Representatives. Uh, Bigger states have more members of the House of Representatives. So, uh, again, the bigger the state, the more uh, members, uh, more electors electors the state has. Uh, So what happens on election day when we vote, when I go to vote in November for president, even though I, uh, well, choose one of the two people running for president or more if there are, but let's say it's just Donald Trump and Joe Biden who are running for president, When I choose one of those people, one of those uh, candidates, I'm not actually voting for them. What I'm doing is I'm voting for a slate of electors, a group of electors from New York State, uh, who will then go to the Electoral College when it meets in uh, December to vote, and they will vote for either Joe Biden or Donald Trump. Uh... Now, under the law, as it's been, uh, the members of the Electoral College usually vote for the person that their state voted for. Uh, So if if, if, if a majority of people in New York State uh, voted for vote for Donald Trump in November, then the electors will also vote for Donald Trump. Uh, That's not necessarily true, though. They don't have to, by law. 
Although now, just last week, if you've been watching the news, the Supreme Court ruled that states can force electors to vote for the candidate that the state voted for. But even even though that's you know the case now, that's pretty much always been that way. Where uh, we've never had a situation where people who voted for a president in a state, their electors did not vote for that person. So that's what happens on election day. When we vote for a president, we're actually voting for electors who then go to vote for the president. Okay. Now, when the 538 electors vote in December, this December for president, uh, the candidate who gets at least 270 electoral votes will win the presidency. Okay, why 270? Because 270 is the majority of 538. Okay? Uh, that's the bare majority of of uh, of uh, electors. Okay, so the president wins the electoral college with 270 electoral votes. Okay, so let's say for example, uh, and and the way it works is that uh, so let's say for example that New York State has. Uh, 33 electors. Okay, so New York State has 33 uh, members of the ha- members of uh, the House and Senate, members of Congress, and so has 33 electoral votes. Uh, electors, meaning electoral votes. In order to win New York State's electoral votes, all a candidate needs to do is when a majority of the voters in New York State. So let's say in November, Joe Biden wins New York State by 30,000 votes. How many electoral votes does he win from New York? 33. He wins them all. It's what we call a winner-take-all system. So the winner of a state the winner of the popular vote, meaning the vote of the people in a state, wins the state's electoral votes completely, all of them, no matter how much the candidate won the popular vote by. So again, if Joe Biden wins by 30,000 votes, he wins all of the, all of New York's 33 electoral votes. If Joe Biden wins uh, New York State's popular vote by 5 million, he still wins 33, all of them. If Joe Biden wins by one vote, just one vote, he still wins all 33 electoral votes. So it doesn't matter what the margin of the popular vote victory is, you win every single electoral vote in the state. Okay, so once a candidate wins uh, enough states, to total 270 electoral votes, he wins. Doesn't matter what the popular vote is because, again, you can win a state by one vote, by 10 votes, by 10 million votes. You still win every single one. You And, and then on the converse, if you lose a state by only one vote or by 10 million votes, it doesn't matter. You lose all the state's electoral votes. Because that's the case, because the Electoral College is allocated by a winner-take-all system, meaning because a candidate in a state wins all that state's electoral votes, no matter how many popular votes they win, because the Electoral College is different than the popular vote, it's not just counting up all the number of people who voted for one candidate and who all the people who voted for the other mm-hmm. and det- deciding who won. Because the electoral college mm-hmm. is different than the popular vote, it is possible for a candidate to lose the popular vote but win the electoral college vote to become president. And that's happened a few times in American history, and that's exactly what happened in our last presidential election when Donald Trump uh, defeated Hillary Clinton. In 2016, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, 
by a little over 3 million votes, uh, meaning more than 3 million people in the United States voted for Hillary Clinton than Donald Trump. But Donald Trump still won the presidency because he won more electoral votes, because he won more states. And he won more states' electoral votes, and he won. And the reason why he was able to do that is, again, because we have what's called the winner-take-all system, where it doesn't matter how many popular votes you win a state by. If you win the state, you win all its electoral votes. Okay, And so uh, we can get a better idea of exactly how that happened by looking at this 2016 Electoral College map, uh, which shows exactly how the vote, how the Electoral College vote uh, was distributed to both candidates, Donald Trump here, the Republican in red, Hillary Clinton, the, uh, the Democrat in blue. So all the blue states were won by Hillary Clinton. All the red states were won by Donald Trump. Okay, so uh, Donald Trump won 325 electoral votes, and Hillary Clinton won 213 because Donald Trump won uh, more than 270 electoral votes. He became president, even though he lost the electoral college. So, if you count, if you just count up all the people who voted. More people voted for Hillary Clinton than Donald Trump, but it doesn't matter because we don't decide the presidency by who won the popular vote, meaning who won more people. It's who won more electoral votes, and, and, and as a product of that, more states. And you see here, Donald Trump won more states. Uh, so to uh, look at this even more deeply, uh, we can use a couple of examples of states uh, to show, to see how it is that Donald Trump was able to win more states and more electoral votes even though he lost the popular vote across the nation. So let's take, for example, California, the biggest state in the country, uh, which has 55 electoral votes, and that's because uh, California is the most populated state in the country. In California has 55 electoral votes. Uh, so in California in uh, 2016, uh, almost 14 million people voted uh, in the presidential election, right? So that's that's quite a lot. 14, uh, almost 14 million people. Uh, 8.75 million voted for Hillary Clinton. 4.49 million voted for Donald Trump. So Hillary Clinton won California by a huge margin, uh, about 4.25 million people, about 4.25 4 million more people in California voted for Hillary Clinton to become president than for Donald Trump to become president. And that's a huge margin uh, and as a result, because more people voted for Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton won all 55 of California's electoral votes. Now, let's look at Wisconsin here. Wisconsin has 10 electoral votes. Donald Trump won Wisconsin. Okay. He won Wisconsin by less than 25,000 votes. It was incredibly close. He only won Wisconsin by 25,000. So uh, compare that. Hillary Clinton won California by 4.25 million. And Donald Trump won Wisconsin by only 25,000. It was very close. But even though it was close, even though... Almost as many people in Wisconsin voted for Hillary Clinton. Donald Trump still won all of all ten of Wisconsin electoral votes because he won more votes because we have a winner take all system. In Michigan, another state with sixteen electoral votes, Trump won Michigan by less than a thousand votes. So incredibly close, about as close as you can get 
given uh, how many people live in, in the state of Michigan. And again, though, even though Hillary Clinton almost won it, she got none of the electoral votes because uh, Donald Trump won the whole thing, and we have a winner take all system. So Trump won 16 there. In Pennsylvania, another big state with 20 electoral votes. Trump won Pennsylvania by less than 50,000 votes. So again, another incredibly close election uh, in Pennsylvania. But again, because we have winner-take-all system, doesn't matter if Trump won Pennsylvania by 50,000 votes or 50 million votes or one vote. He won all the Pennsylvania votes because he won Pennsylvania's popular vote. So if you if you combine Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, Trump won 111 electoral votes with uh, just about a 200,000 vote margin over Hillary Clinton, meaning that in the state of Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania put together only about, between those three states, only about 200,000 more people voted for Donald Trump than Hillary Clinton, yet Donald Trump won all 111 of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the of the uh, votes in in uh, in uh, 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 those states uh, and uh, wait not uh, yeah okay so uh, so that's how uh, you know that's how Trump won so Trump won a a, a big margin of uh, a small margin of a lot of these states that were very close, like Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, uh, uh, Florida, uh, even Texas, uh, where Hillary Clinton won, she won big. She won by millions of voters in California, millions of voters in New York, and even though she won those states by millions, she still didn't wasn't able to come up with enough enough electoral votes to reach two seventy, and Donald Trump did. So that's why uh, you can win the electoral college but lose the popular vote. Okay, uh, that's what can happen. Uh, another time this happened was in 2000 when uh, George uh, W. Bush ran against Al Gore. And in that election, it was even closer. By election night, by the end of election night, Every state in the country had been decided except for Florida because Florida was so close and it ended up coming to just a few hundred votes. Uh, and in fact, it was so close that uh, it was not even decided by election night. Uh, but it was so close in the electoral college that whoever won Florida won the presidency. Now, when the popper vote was totaled, Al Gore was leading George Bush by more votes in the popular vote than Florida has votes total. So it would be like, let's say, uh, Florida has, has 100,000 votes. Al Gore was already leading uh, George Bush by more than 100,000 votes. So if it was just up to the popular vote, Florida would not have mattered. Al Gore would have been announced as president on election night. But because we have electoral college and because the, nobody was at 270 yet and Florida would put either one of the two candidates above 270, uh, we had to wait until after election day and then the courts got involved. So it wasn't until December, actually, uh, close to Christmas time, that... 
uh, Florida was uh, decided for George Bush, and George Bush was made president in the United States. So, Leotoro College is what elects the president, not the popular vote. And because of that, and because of the way we have this winner-take-all system, where in order to win a state's uh, electoral votes, all you need to do is win that state's popular vote by at least one vote, that is why a situation like this can happen, where Donald Trump loses the popular vote, but wins the electoral college, and thus becomes president. Okay, so why do we elect the president this way? Uh, it's not exactly democratic, right? Uh, if it would, if we wanted to have a truly democratic uh, uh, presidential election system, we would do it the way we elect senators, uh, members of the House of Representatives, uh, uh, Congress, and and the rest, uh, governors, and the rest. We would. Uh, just say, okay, whoever wins the uh, popular vote wins. The reason we have this system, the reason we have an electoral college is a result of a compromise between northern and southern states. Uh, Just like many other compromises that led to the formation of the, uh, the constitution we have, uh, there was a uh, disagreement between the states, particularly northern and southern states, over how to elect the president. Uh, some uh, some states, uh, particularly northern states, wanted to have a straight election. Whoever gets the most votes wins. Southern states didn't like that because... Uh, in 1787, when the uh, founding fathers wrote the Constitution uh, in Philadelphia that summer, uh, more white men, the kind of people who would be voters, lived in the North. So n- the northern states had more voters. And so the southern states worried that if we elected the president simply by a straight popular vote, then northern states would be able to elect the president and southern states uh, would, uh, would would never be able to elect somebody that they wanted as president. And that was a particular worry to southern states because of the issue of slavery. The uh, southern states were worried that uh, in, uh, in, in, you know, sometime in the future, uh, a northern president and a northern Congress, a northern dominated Congress, would try to end slavery. And so, southern states uh, sort of forced the northern states to accept the compromise where we uh, don't elect uh, uh, the presidency by straight popular vote but that we elect it through the social college system where the electors would be distributed to different states according to their population, according to the number of representatives they have. And remember, because of three-fifths compromise, slaves who would not be eligible to vote for president, obviously because they were slaves, uh, would still contribute to the number of uh, representatives in the House that every southern state would have because slaves would be counted three-fifths of a person for the purpose of deciding how many representatives a state would have. So by having an electoral college system, uh, even though the northern states still had more voters, uh, southern states would uh, be able to close the gap between the number of voters in the north and the number of voters in the south. So essentially, the creation electoral college uh, uh, system, uh, because it was based on a thesis compromise, and 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 that uh, compromise. Uh, 
southern states ended up getting 13 more electoral votes than they would have had if slaves were not uh, were not uh, selected. Uh, and so northern states still had more electoral votes, but uh, the advantage that, that the North had over the South in the presidential election system was cut down considerably because of the electoral college. So the northern states still have the advantage, but not as big an advantage as they would have if you had a popular vote system of letting everybody just vote rather than the electoral college system that they created. Uh, and that sort of worked because uh, the first few presidents in the United States were all from the South, and particularly all from Virginia, which was the biggest state in the country at the time. Uh, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, uh, uh, some of those first presidents were all from the South, uh, all from, uh, mostly from Virginia. Uh, uh, the only exception really was the second president, I said, John Adams, who uh, was the first vice president of the United States, he was from Massachusetts. Uh, but most of the other uh, first few presidents were all Southerners. So today there's uh, a big debate uh, over whether to keep the Electoral College. Uh, some people like the idea of the Electoral College, uh, but many people do not like it. Uh, and so there's a debate going on between those who want to keep it and those who want to get rid of it. And in fact, uh, one of the uh, the response papers they have to write uh, this semester, uh, one of the two, has to do with uh, a, an essay that I gave you to read, an article that I gave you to read uh, about uh, the debate uh, over whether or not to keep the Electoral College. Okay, okay so... Let's uh, move to uh, talk about uh, what exactly the president does, what what exactly his role is, what his uh, powers are. Uh, the president uh, basically is head of the executive branch. Okay, so the executive branch is one of the three branches of the federal government. Uh, we've got the executive branch, we've got the judicial branch, and the legislative branch. Well, the president is the head of the executive branch. Uh, the president oversees the federal government's executive departments, uh, meaning uh, what are those? Those are the State Department, the Defense Department, etc. Uh, these comprise the government's bureaucracy. These are the agencies of government that, mm, that implement the laws that are passed by Congress that actually do the day-to-day -day work of government. Uh, the president also oversees the White House Executive Office. Uh, the advisors inside the White House who work closely with the president day to day to make policy to run the White House and give the president advice. Uh, the National Security Council, which gives the president advice about issues of national security, uh, issues of military affairs, war and peace. And the Council of Economic Advisors, which uh, advises the president on issues of economic policy, uh, the U.S. economy. So the president uh, supervises both. He's the boss of both the federal government's executive departments and the White House's executive office. Presidents have different sources of power. Uh, one of these, uh, uh, and one of these uh, uh, sources of power is what we call enumerated powers. Enumerated powers are powers that are enumerated right in the Constitution. What do we mean by that? They're actually written. Enumerate, to enumerate means to, to spell out. These are powers directly stated in Article 2 of the Constitution. Article 2 of the Constitution is the part of the Constitution that uh, describes the presidency. Uh, the executive branch of government. Uh, so two examples of enumerated powers that the president has 
in the Constitution where you can actually look and see in writing that the Constitution says that this is a power of the president, the power to make treaties, and the power to hire people. So uh, we talked about treaties in, in the last lecture, how the president has the power to negotiate and sign treaties, agreements with foreign countries, and then the Senate has the power to confirm those treaties and vote those treaties into law. Uh, the, uh, the, the power to make treaties is a, uh, is a, a power that's directly uh, discussed in the Constitution. And also the power to hire people. So the, the people who work in the White House, his advisors, the president says gets to hire his own advisors. So the president has the ability to hire people. So the power to make treaties, the power to hire people, are, uh, are what we call enumerated powers. Implied powers are not... Uh, enumerated in the Constitution are not exactly written down, but it's understood uh, that the president should have these powers because these are. It's logical to think that the president has these powers uh, because the president has these enumerated powers. So, for example, the power to fire people. Nowhere in the Constitution does it say that the president can fire people who work for him in the White House. It only says that he has the power to hire people. But the idea is that, well, if the, if the Constitution says that the president has the power to hire people, then it's only logical to conclude that if the president can hire people, then he can also fire them. And so uh, the power to fire people is an example of what we call implied powers or not. Uh, they're not written down, but it's understood by common sense that these are powers that the president has. Inherent powers are powers that presidents claim as inherent in the office, meaning that these, even though they're not written down, uh, the president has these powers because of the fact that he is that he is a president they that, that uh, they're almost like implied powers uh, powers of the president has simply because the president is the president so for example the power to use military force the Constitution does not say that the president has the power to use military force uh, in fact the uh, power to declare war, is a power that's given to Congress, is a power that the Constitution gives to Congress. But the but what the Constitution does say is that the president is commander-in-chief of the military, meaning he's the head of the military. So then it's logical, just like the idea of implied power, is that the power to use military force is inherent in the presidency, meaning that the presidency has this power simply because of who he is and what he, what powers he has. Because if the president is in charge of the military, then obviously he can order them to use military force. And we should also conclude that because the president's job is to protect us, as the head of the executive branch, then he should have the power to uh, use the military if, for example, we're attacked, rather than waiting for Congress to step in and act, that the president should have the power to act right away, like George Bush did on 9-11, for example, without waiting for Congress. So that's so implied powers and inherent powers are almost the same, but a little bit different. And then statutory powers are powers that are delegated to presidents by congressional statute, okay. uh, meaning that these are powers that are given to the president because Congress decided to give the president this power by passing a law. So, for example, let's go back to 9-11 uh, uh, as an example. Uh, in 2002, one, uh, just a few months after uh, 
Congress passed a law called the Authorizations for the Use of Military Force in Afghanistan and Iraq in 2002. And that was uh, congressional uh, 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 permission for the president to launch a war in Afghanistan against al-Qaeda, uh, the group that, the terrorist group that uh, committed the 9-11 attacks. Uh, so, uh, as I said before, uh, the power to declare war is not a power that the president has. It's a power that the uh, Congress has. And so uh, Congress, by uh, passing the authorization for the use of military force in Afghanistan and Iraq in 2002, was basically giving uh, the president permission to uh, go to war against against Afghanistan, even though they didn't call it a war, they authorized the use of military force to the president. So presidents have those formal powers, and, and I'll go back for a second just to um, enumerated powers, implied powers, inherent powers, statutory powers. Presidents also have informal power. This is power that they don't have as president. It doesn't come from the Constitution, but it comes simply because of the fact that the president, the position of president, is so respected and and, and so uh, powerful. Uh, the president, for example, is the leader of his political party. So Donald Trump today, it, he's, he's a Republican. And because he's president, he's the head of the Republican Party. Uh, so the Republican Party uh, looks to him to lead them. He decides what the what principles and what policies and what decisions the Republican Party is going to uh, push for. And that's because not because the Constitution says that he's the head of the political party. No, there's no law, no Constitution that says this, but it's simply because the president, as powerful as he is as a person, has the ability to control the, the Republican Party. And we've seen that, particularly over the course of Donald Trump's presidency, there are, there, at the beginning of his presidency, there were many uh, Republicans in Congress who did not agree with his policies and who actually spoke out uh, publicly in opposition to him. Most of those Republicans are gone, meaning they've lost re-election. Why did they lose re-election? Because when they went for re-election, Donald Trump told his supporters not to vote for them because they didn't support him. And so when other Republicans saw this, saw the power that Trump has as, as the head of the Republican Party, the ability to tell voters what to do and have them listen, they fell in line. And now you don't see many Republicans at all uh, publicly opposing the president because the president has such a firm grip, has such total control over his party as the leader of his political party. That's an example of Donald Trump using in his informal power to control the, his political party, the Republican Party. Uh, presidents have to be good at projecting an image. And the way that they do this can give them a lot of inform informal power. Presidents have to cultivate public opinion and know how to engage with the media. Uh, Donald Trump is very good at this, especially because of the way he uses Twitter. Uh, his supporters uh, love him uh, because uh, he is so direct uh, and so forceful and tough when he engages with the media and when he uh, goes on Twitter and tweets. And so he's good at projecting an image among his own supporters, uh, not so much with the rest of the country, 
which is why right now he's he's losing in the polls to Joe Biden. But if you look at his own Republican Party, over 90% of the Republican Party support him. Democrats and independents don't support him. And that's why he may lose the presidency if Donald Trump is to win the presidency. One thing he's going to have to do better at is project an image of having control over the two main crises that are going on in the country right now, the coronavirus and the uh, aftermath of the George Floyd killing and the Black Lives Matter protests. So that's uh, a, a quick discussion of uh, the presidency. Uh, I hope you got something out of it.